I'm so happy to be here. Like you said, this has been about seven years since the last time I've spoken at a conference. So uh, I'm a little nervous. Not, I'm going to try not to not say um and uh a lot, but hopefully we'll make it through this together. Um, my name is Mark Rickard. Uh, I am a principal software engineer at Infinite Red. Uh, I've been with Infinite Red before, since before they were Infinite Red. Uh, I've been working with these guys for a long time, and I love them. They're, they're so great. Um, but I'm going to say something very contra uh, controversial. I am not on Twitter. <laughs> okay, good. Uh, maybe not that controversial then. Uh, so if you have questions about my talk or, or want to get copies of my slides or something like that, like, come talk to me in person. Like, I'd love to have a conversation with you. Uh, so a little bit about me. Uh, I am an extreme sports enthusiast. Uh, I don't like the term adrenaline junkie, like that, that's a little derogatory, but I'm an enthusiast. So uh, I like uh, climbing mountains and then taking the fast way down. Uh, I am an avid outdoorsman. Um, I've climbed the Eiger in Switzerland. I've jumped off of it. Um, I've, I've done a lot of really amazing things through my extreme sports career. Uh, I'm, I used to be a former full-time traveler. Uh, I lived in a converted sprinter van for seven years, just traveling around. Uh, and this is me at the Oslo National Museum next to Edvard Monk's uh, The Scream. One of five, by the way, that he painted. Uh, I've been to about five continents and 35 national parks in the United States. And currently I live about five miles from the entrance of Arches National Park in Moab, Utah. Uh, I'm a prolific maker. Uh, not only do I make software, I make physical things as well. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I love 3D printing. I love low voltage electronics, specifically like LED projects. Um, I've recently gotten into metal casting and forging with aluminum and copper, and so that's really fun. I'm also a cat dad. I love all of God's creatures, but Max is my favorite uh, non-human creature. And I'm a professional React Native developer. Uh, I've been in the software industry for about two and a half decades, and I've been working in React Native since about 2015. So that's like version 0.14, I think. So it's been a while. Um, but being ingrained in the React Native ecosystem for so long has taught me a thing or two about keeping up with technologies and learning how to effectively communicate the things I've learned to my team members. And I hope what I share today um, will help you more effectively communicate to your team members and your clients. Uh, and to your users, so. Uh, oh yeah, and that's me uh, in, the, uh, in the back with the Infinite Red team, so. And my one commit to the React Native Core library. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm gonna talk to you today about something called outrage-driven development, and don't feel bad if you've never heard of it because I made it up about three months ago. So we've all felt outrage in our lives, and there's a lot of problems in the world, including things like human rights violations, corruption, discrimination, and senseless acts of violence. And I, I myself was a, was a victim of a senseless act of violence about a month and a half ago when someone just randomly shot a gun into our campground. Uh, my friend was shot in the stomach and had to be airlifted, but he's gonna be okay. But those aren't the kind of outrages that I'm gonna be talking about today. I'm gonna be talking about little outrages, like things that bother you when you see them, things that you know could be better, but they aren't for some reason, like, like the customer service phone trees or the American healthcare system. <laughs> oh, and by the way, I created all the images in this presentation using various prompts of outrage and stable diffusion, so please forgive any three-armed men or six-fingered six <laughs> men. Um, and I guess I own the copyright to the presentation, but not the images, I don't know. AI copyright is hard, moving on. Um, but these, the things I'm going to talk to you about today are like little outrages, um, blatantly inefficient or duplicated logic, no tests, maybe too many tests, uh, uh, obsolete dependencies. Uh, a lot of this, this stuff I'm going to be talking about today falls under the, the title of technical debt. So, but here's, here's, a, here's what uh, I'd find uh, outrage-driven de development. It's a way of transforming code-based frustrations into meaningful results and actionable change. So day to day, I work on a very large React Native project. Uh, the development team is five to seven developers at any given time. Uh, and almost three years ago, it was converted from native iOS and Android into one single React Native application. And when it was ported over, a lot of the logic structures and, 
uh, was just, they were just translated over to JavaScript without very much regard to the implications of performance or you know, the React way or the React native way. Um, our code base is about a quarter million lines of TypeScript. There are multiple legacy implementations that we turned into React Native modules so that they can all run together in the same ecosystem. And we had developers at varying levels of experience and skills with, with React Native. A lot of them were the native developers that then had to convert and learn how to program in React Native. So it's been a really great teaching experience for me to be able to help level up their team uh, and make meaningful uh, results and actionable change in their code base. So let's start with some key principles of outrage-driven development. One of the things I love about working on my current app is that I get to help millions of people save money on a daily basis through the app. It makes me feel really good that I can help people in a meaningful way like this. Uh, and this helps me have an excellence and an owner mindset. Because I care if the app is broken. I care if it's going to work or not. Because if, if the app isn't working as well as it could be, people aren't going to use it. And then they're not going to save that money. Um, so I find that the more I care about the app, the, the more it, it's going to contribute to the app's success. So find something that you can care about and you can flip that switch from the good enough mentality to the excellence mentality. Uh, and having excellence at the forefront of what you do on a daily basis is uh, not only gonna help guide your decision-making processes, it's also going to help you shine in your work, in your communication, and in your attitude. So embracing positive change is another key principle of outrage-driven development. Embracing change isn't easy for a lot of us, but embracing positive change can be a lot easier. There's still some that resist this, though, uh, and many stakeholders need to understand why change is needed before mucking with something that already might be good enough. The next thing is inclusivity and engagement, and this, in, this means to include your entire team in the learning process. You want to do your work out in the open for everyone to see, and this is especially important for consultants like me that might not have a full grasp on the entire ecosystem of the client's systems. Like, there are some parts of the business that I just don't have access to, so it makes it very difficult for me to start to research a bug, so I have to go and find someone else that's going to be included in this whole decision-making process. And then the last key point or principle of uh, outrage-driven development is continuing education. Because I can't help level my team up unless I level myself up. You know, the, it, there's many industries like nursing and aviation and lawyering. I don't know, is that a word? Lawyering. Lawyers, they, they require continuing education credits in order to keep their licenses. But in the tech world, we don't really have that. We're responsible for our own continuing education. So kudos to you guys for being here today. Yeah. So you're probably thinking, OK, what is this really odd new development technology, or the technique, rather? Uh, what can odd do for me? It can help you become a better developer. Outrage is a powerful force that we all know can be used for good or not so good. Uh, being outraged about things can drive action and innovation. We see it in the world all around us from protests to political action committees. Action drives a lot of, in uh, outrage drives a lot of innovation, but we rarely hear about it in a good context. You can be outraged about something and do nothing about it. You can be outraged about something and forget about it the next day, because outrage seems to be such a pervasive part of our society today, we've almost become desensitized to it. Social media uses small outrages to drive engagement. We all know this. There are dedicated online communities to generating these little micro outrages like the Reddit mildly infuriating. But the odd methodology brings these kinds of phrases to top of mind. That's weird. I wonder why it did that. That doesn't seem right. These are all mental triggers to take note of. Whenever I say one of these phrases to myself, it's an indication to start an, invest an investigation. You become a detective and figure out what exactly is causing my brain to say, oh, that's weird. Uh, the key is to remember, though, that like, small focused pull requests and changes are a lot faster and easier for a team to review 
than large pull requests with multiple fixes. And so separating these little tiny outrages from your day-to-day -day work and the features you might be working on um, is a really important thing. So let's, uh, let's take a moment and figure out how to find outrageous code. Uh, I went through a couple of my old pull requests uh, to find uh, some examples of where I'd found something odd and fixed it. Uh, these fixes almost never have a JIRA ticket. Like now, the project managers in the room are probably screaming internally, um, and they're gonna roast me for not creating a ticket, assigning it to myself, estimating the points, <laughs> adding it to the current sprint, and then marking it as complete. Like, I think, I, I think that just using some visual aids uh, and a pull request is going to, to help just streamline the process and reduce friction as much as possible. So uh, I document before and after screenshots uh, with animated GIFs, and my project manager doesn't seem to mind it for these little one or two point fixes. Uh, but let's be honest, I might not do it if I had to do all that stuff, all the overhead. Um, but let's talk about a specific example I found a few weeks ago. Have you ever used a haversign function? Haversine? I don't know how you pronounce it. It's a way to calculate the distance between two points on a sphere. And uses a lot of, a lot of uh, math and radians and pi. Um, but I found this code, and I, I don't know if you're gonna be able to see this very well, but um, it's a get distance in miles. That immediately was a red flag to me. Because, uh, I don't know, uh, this is America, and we, we do use the, uh, the imperial system, but the rest of the world uses meters. And I've never in my life seen a Haversine function that returns miles. <laughs> and so that was like an immediate red flag. Um, and then as I delved deep into, deeper into it, I found that the get distance in meters was calling miles. And then all my views in my object model were converting meters or miles to meters and then to kilometers. I'm like, this does not make any sense whatsoever. So yeah, you can see here, it's what is 1.1515. I don't know what that even is. Um, so yeah, you can see we're, we're getting distance in kilometers, then it's asking for distance in meters, then it's asking for distance in miles, and then it's calling the helper function. So this immediately was a red flag to me, and I'm like, I have to fix this. Uh, you can also notice that all, all of the rounding errors right here, because we're, we're, we're rounding every single result of every single function, we're introducing, uh, we're introducing inaccuracies into these calculations. So here's a little bit easier way to, to, to visualize it. It calculates the circumference of the Earth and returns miles, rounded. Takes the miles and converts it to meters, rounded again. Uses meters and then converts to miles or kilometers for display to the users, rounded again. And I found that over small distances, this would only have about a half a percentage um, error rate or so. But the further and further you got away, the, the bigger the problems became. So let's see, look at the solution here. We use distance in meters as our base helper function so that we can, and then we use the geolib get distance function that and we know it returns meters in whole numbers, so we don't need to round anything here. The get distance in miles function converts to meters and rounds to two decimal places. Uh, the object model uses the helper function to get the meters and stores it as a computed value, and kilometers and miles, which is what we're gonna display to the user, does the simple standard conversion and rounds the number for display. This feels so much cleaner. Um, it gets rid of a lot of the rounding errors, and it's gonna make the calculations better on average because we're using the standard of meters and only converting and rounding at the last step. So more ways to find outrageous code. This is the Chain React app here as uh, displayed in two different states of my Samsung Galaxy Fold 2 running Android 12. Does anybody use a foldable device as their daily driver? Anybody? No, I don't, one, I see one here, two, two, two in the back. Well, Google is releasing a, the Pixel Fold, and so my anticipation is that there are gonna be a lot more people on foldable phones, so we need to figure out how to be ready for that. Like, go out and pay the $1,800 or get your company to pay the $1,800 to get one of these test devices so that you can see how things are gonna react on the phones people are actually using in, in, out in the world. Uh, the Android emulator can also emulate foldable phones, but not very well. Um, 
Then you also want to look at your metrics and your data to see what devices your users actually have and look at your crash reporting tools to try and find correlations in what devices are the most troublesome. You can turn up and down the system font size. Like, don't just change it a little. Like, I've done that before. I, I, I'm getting old, I'm 41, and my eyes are starting to go a little bit, and so um, I turn mine up a little bit. But when I'm developing, I turn it all the way up. Like, turn on the extra big, um, and when you, when, when you do that, you'll find that, well, maybe some of our components aren't using our, our standardized uh, font sizing. Uh, because the app I work in right now, we limit it to like 1.8 of our base font size. And I discovered that React Navigation wasn't limiting the size of the title bar because the, we had to specify that in a different place. So changing the, the, uh, the accessibility settings and the font size of your app is gonna be a really great way to find outrageous things in your code. I call this the cool jazz test. You see the uh, cool jazz font right there? <laughs> Luckily, the, uh, the Chain React app passed this test with flying colors because we use a custom embedded font. Uh, but have you ever seen a screenshot with somebody's phone in Comic Sans or Papyrus? Like, people actually do this. Like, I've seen Facebook screenshots with the Disney font on it. <laughs> So changing your system font to something clearly different from your actual font you want used in the app are gonna help you find areas of your app that need some TLC. Uh, maybe another Im developer imported the text component from React Native instead of using your custom implementation. It's a really th easy thing to do by accident, especially when you're working with a large team of people. Sometimes things don't get pull, re pull reviewed very well and it just makes it into production. So you gotta figure out where these things are. And then constantly be switching between light and dark mode. If your app has a light and dark mode, you need to learn the keyboard shortcut by heart, the command shift A in your simulator will just swap the system back and forth between light mode and dark mode. Uh, as was uh, with everything, Android's a little more difficult. Uh, and I usually just set up yarn commands to do these system, uh, system commands here. But being outraged doesn't mean you have to get all worked up and mad about something. Your outrage can be channeled into positive change and useful energy, but you need to be careful about outrage driving any kind of outrageous behavior. We all know that when we let our outrage get the better of us, bad things can happen, but we can make rash decisions or be quick to find someone to blame. The dangers of using outrage-driven development come when you move from the code to the relationships. Don't take that outrage out on your coworkers or clients. Focus on finding a solution that can quench that outrage. The goal is to always be moving forward, always be looking for a solution, and always treating your peers with respect and dignity, even when someone makes a mistake. I view taking the time to explain issues to people as part of my job as a consultant. I don't have to be writing code 100% of the time in order to provide value to the team. And showing up with specific knowledge about a problem and being able to explain clearly why the code is incorrect is going to help level up everyone on your team so that hopefully the mistake won't be made again in the future. Speaking of making the same mistakes over and over again, you should use technology to enforce the rules. React Native gives us some ESLint rules by default uh, to help us mitigate some common issues that, that people had in their code bases. And ESLint is such a great tool. Um, but once your code base grows to the size of the Library of Congress, you're gonna, and you've got a diverse group of people working on it at the same time, setting up some guide rails to prevent future issues is something you should definitely do. This is a little snippet of our ESLint rules. Um, we use a, a rule called no restricted imports. And it's a really great way to help ensure that troublesome imports aren't used by the development team. When you have seven people working on something, they might not have seen a pull request where you said, oh, we can no longer use, use window dimensions because it has a one render cycle delay until it actually reports the numbers. And I don't know if you guys know that or not, but you should probably be using use safe area frame from React Native safe area. I think that's what it is. Um, the, the popular one. <laughs> uh, 
but using linter rules to enforce good behavior can mitigate future bugs and frustrations. Uh, and they, uh, and of uh, like solving the same problems over and over again uh, by, uh, by setting up those guardrails kind of like bumpers on a uh, bowling alley, you know? And don't, and you can see I've got a message here. Please use app specific implementations. Please import text from app styled instead. Like so that when, when someone who may not know better tries to do it and they try to commit their code, our uh, pre-commit hook is going to use ESLint and tell them, oh wait, you did something wrong here. Maybe you should take a moment and step back and figure out wh what's going on. Ask someone else. Figure out what you should be using instead. So using technologies and tools at, the, at your disposal uh, can help drive positive change. Another way you can drive positive change is by asking good questions. I think a lot of people struggle with asking good questions, and I did for a long time too. I would wonder why I wasn't getting a response, or if I did get a response, there was a lot of back and forth trying to figure out exactly what needed to be done by whom. Uh, sometimes a simple answer would take over a day to get from a client. Either I was asking the wrong question, I wasn't clearly laying it out, or I wasn't giving enough context for someone to answer the question. Asking good questions is a skill that can revolutionize the way you communicate with your clients and team members. It can make a huge difference in the responses you get. If you ask a vague question, you're gonna get a vague answer. Identifying the issue clearly is the first step in asking good questions. Tell your team how you find, found the issue. Something like, I was on the screen tapping on this button and I realized that we weren't disabling it while the API call was in flight. And so they were able to press it a bunch of times and now we've got a bunch of API calls queued up and then the app freezes. Create a story that others can relate to. Realizations are the big drivers for change in my, in my opinion. You can't fix a problem till you realize it's a problem. So having a story to go along with your revelation will help get others on board to help come up with a solution for you. In your question, you should state what you already know about the problem and link to any relevant code so others can quickly see it and try to help. Again, the key here is to reduce friction, uh, not just for you, but for other team members. You may already have the code up on your screen and it's only gonna take a couple seconds to ensure the people that you're asking for help have the proper context. So now that we have a story about what's going on, links to the relevant areas of code or similar issues on GitHub and Stack Overflow, make sure to tag people specifically. Like we use Slack at work and we, we tag people specifically about questions and uh, it, it, it usually notifies them unless they have their notifications turned on. But maybe you don't know the team member, which team member worked on this specific area, um, you can, you can ask someone else who might know better than you. And so tagging people who might be able to help is a huge, a huge way to ask good questions. Assuming the best intentions is critical for maintaining good relationships in a safe and supportive working environment. We're all here to work together for a common goal. And I know get, get blame doesn't usually lie, but casting blame is a really good way to make sure that people don't want to work with you anymore. Use visual aids. Visual aids, some people are visual learners and so it can help them quickly understand without having to spend their own time researching it and building a branch and trying to figure out exactly what you're talking to. Take some screenshots, make some animated GIFs or movie files. You can upload MOV files to GitHub uh, and they work really well. So use screenshots and you've already got the app built and you already have in, in the context. So make sure to give that context and pass it along to other people. And then sending multiple messages in a row. This is one of my huge pet peeves, like shotgun style. Hey Mark, what do you think about this? And it just keeps coming after more, more, again and again and again and again. And you don't know which one to reply to because there's just so many messages. You don't want shotgun style messages. You want a single call to a message with, a, with a, all the relevant information and a call to action. Let's look at a bad question asker. Hey, Jamin. Someone on the team doesn't know how to properly lay out React components. The component's using a fixed height and it shouldn't be. 
What's gonna happen when the font size is increased and text overflows? Here's a link to how Flexbox works in React Native. <laughs> so you notice that there's not really anything to take action on here. It's asking a really vague question that assumes the person who made the mistake should have known it was a mistake when they made it. But they obviously didn't or they wouldn't have made the mistake. This question does everything wrong. It blames, it assumes they should have known better, it doesn't provide a clear path to a solution, and it passively aggressively links to the user to a learning resource. So let's look at how I might ask this question in the odd way. I was looking over the code on component in line 344 with a link to the, to the line of code and noticed if the system font size is increased, the fixed height is going to cut off the bottom of the text characters. Was this fixed height done on purpose? See, I'm not assuming anything there. If so, what was the reason? I'd like to ensure all components are using Flexbox layout with a link so users with larger font sizes can still read this text. And then I tag Jamin, you were the last to touch this code. Is it safe to remove the fixed height style? I don't know. <laughs> uh, so, as you can see from the question, I've clearly laid out the issue, assumed it may have been done on purpose, and asked the reason. And if it was a mistake, I provided a path to resolve it. Remember to follow up. Other team members have their own concerns that they're working on. In today's asynchronous working environment, teams working across multiple time zones, questions can get lost in the barrage of Slack or Microsoft Teams messages. Give the person you tagged a reasonable amount of time to stop what they're doing, switch contexts, process your message, and reply. This time frame's different for each question, depending on the question itself. But what does a good follow-up look like? Hey, Jamin, I'm wondering if you had time to look at this question from yesterday. I'd really love to get these changes taken care of by the end of the week. If you're busy right now, is there someone else that might be able to answer this for me? And so I ask him, to, and, and I give him permission to send it to someone else if he doesn't know. So an outrage-driven development requires constant growth and continuing education. We all learn together. You wouldn't be here if you didn't want to learn. And all the amazing talks you're going to hear today and tomorrow are going to be posted to YouTube at some point. And you can take these and share them with your coworkers. You get the benefit of being able to sit here and listen to us and take notes. But um, these conferences uh, talks will be available. So share your free favorite presentation with your coworkers when you get home. Margaret Fuller, the famous 19th century women's rights activist, said, if you have knowledge, let others light their candles in it. And I see I've only got two minutes left, so I'm going to speed through the rest. Um, everyone can be a teacher. You can teach someone sm a small thing or a big thing. We have a teacher here on stage with us. He teaches people all the time. Anyone can be a teacher if you've learned something. Knowledge is not only power, but it's influence and a catalyst for innovation but only when communicated effectively. Making a 500-page PDF of everything you learned this week isn't really going to effectively teach anyone unless it's a large language model that doesn't have feelings or desires. <laughs> uh, clearly, stable diffusion is not good at text renditions. There are entire university-level courses you can take about how to effectively communicate with various types of people with different backgrounds and learning styles. And I'm not going to go into the psychology of communication here, but I wanted to touch on a few key points here that will help you communicate effectively across the board, which is knowing your audience, explain how your solution solves the problem, use metrics and concrete numbers to quantify what you've done, visual, use visual aids, and provide links to learning resources. So, and you can see here an example of what I did here. Normalize and optimize shadow usage. Fix blur view performance issues. 212% improvement in time to interaction. Like, like, this is using metrics to help quantify what I've done. And I'm happy to report that uh, in dev mode, uh, our branch used to take 32 seconds to, to, to boot. Then this one took 10.25, and now we've got it down to about two and a half seconds. So, yeah. And then a quote from me. Empower others with your awesome discoveries, inspiring them to, to unleash their own greatness. And we all win by lifting each other up, and I win by putting my crappy quote into chat GPT and having it generate a much better quote. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
So some final tips and tricks for being an odd developer. Practice using empathy with your users, clients, and team members. Consider user security, privacy, and accessibility as core design principles throughout the development process. Try to foster a culture of learning and experimentation. Remember, everyone is at a different point in their learning journey. That's why we had three different workshops yesterday for different things at different skill levels. Treat your customers, clients, and coworkers how you'd want to be treated, you know, the golden rule. And measure the impact of your work. So I really hope that this talk has given you a good overview of my completely made up development methodology for channeling those small frustrations into meaningful action and positive change within your organization. Uh, just remember to take note of those, that's weird, moments that will help you uh, level up your React Native app and your team by fostering an, an environment of learning, mutual respect, and positive change to move us all in the direction that we want to go, which is being better than we were yesterday. So, thank you.